All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Bricker, and I'm the chairman of the Arkansas District Export Council. And uh, I want to welcome you to Export Compliance Webinar featuring Mr. David Noah. Uh, I'd like to start today by thanking our sponsors. Uh, without them, none of this would be possible. It's the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, as well as Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. So uh, thanks to them for uh, sponsoring us on, on these webinars that we're able to put on. I really do appreciate you all joining us today. Um, for those of you that aren't quite sure who the DEC is and what we do, allow me to do a quick introduction. We're a private nonprofit organization that brings experienced international business people to potential exporters. Um, there, there's 35 of us, and each DEC member has been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce because of their real-world expertise in international trade matters. Now, having said that, we don't have the answers to everything, but what we can do is introduce you to someone who does. So we're basically a community of connections within the exporting world. My hope for the day is that you walk away from this webinar with a little bit more confidence in your exporting abilities. And at the end of this webinar, if you still have any questions and you don't feel comfortable asking it here or in the chat, I advise you to uh, reach out to us on our website at exportarkansas.org and we'll have one of our members reach out to you. Basically, we wanna be your strategic partner to help you grow your exports which helps grow your bottom line. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce everyone to your moderator this afternoon. It's Mr. Rudy Ortiz. Rudy has recently retired from the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and he's also the previous chairman of the District Export Council. Today, he is the owner of Strategic Business Services, LLC, where he can help companies in a wide array of international business and exporting needs. He's a certified global business professional, as well as a U.S. Department of Commerce certified export and trade counselor. Uh, and for these reasons, he is the DEX education chair. Rudy, I uh, really appreciate you spearheading all of this. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Jonathan, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, we're, we've got a really great class uh, coming up, th uh, this class here. You know, um, uh, the uh, documentation sometimes can be pretty complex. And of course, the uh, the rules change quite a bit. And that's why we uh, asked uh, David Noah, who's the president of Shipping Solutions, to to be the, uh, the uh, presenter today on this topic, because he has uh, a lot of expertise. And the other thing that uh, was particularly interesting to me is that uh, uh, David has a software company uh, and uh, that does that helps people with their documentation. And and quite frankly, uh, I was uh, previously unaware that there was a lot of tools out there to be able to help, you know, especially smaller companies deal with the documentation, which can be really onerous. And so, uh, in talking to him, I found out more uh, about these different tools that are available, uh, in, including his. And it, because of his expertise, we decided that we were going to ask him to talk about the documentation, uh, but just wanted for you to be aware that uh, Davis Company and other companies as well provide software solutions that can help you with the documentation. Uh, David is the founder and president of the uh, company called Shipping Solutions. And as, as I indicated earlier, it's a software company that develops and sells export documentation and compliance software that's targeted at small and medium-sized businesses uh, that, of course, export. Uh, David is a frequent speaker and an export on export regulations and compliance issues and he's published hundreds of articles on the on the topic of passages uh the international uh, international trade blog and i really would uh, encourage you to to look at that blog but it has lots and lots of articles on having to do with uh, documentation and exporting and a, and a whole bunch of other issues and with that david i think we'll let you uh, take it over all right, thank you very much, Rudy. Thank you for inviting me to be here and to, to do this presentation. I really appreciate it. I am going to share my screen so you can see my presentation. All right, do you see that now? 
I do. Okay, great. So I'll get started. Uh, again, um, my presentation today is export compliance, 11 required documents. It's based on one of those blog posts I've written for our international trade blog on our website. Uh, I wrote it back in 2018. I update it regularly, including very recently. Uh, it happens to be the most popular blog post I've ever written. Uh, it's generated, generates uh, tens of thousands of views each month, and it has now surpassed a half million total views. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, so if you find this presentation helpful, you can go and, and find the article with a similar name on our on our blog, shippingsolutions.com slash blog. It's there free and includes links to free copies of the different documents that I'm talking about today, as well as other free resources that we make available on our website. So I will uh, uh, move on. So let's talk about export documents. So as you can see, there are many different documents that may be required depending on what you're shipping, how you're shipping it, and where it's going. But in a typical export exchange, it all starts when you receive an inquiry about one or more of your products. And that inquiry may include a request for a quotation. Now, if this, inqu this inquiry came from a domestic prospect, you probably, gotta, you probably have a standard quotation form that you use. But in an international transaction, your quote would typically be provided in the form of a pro forma invoice. That's because your international prospect may need a pro forma invoice to arrange for financing, to open a letter of credit, to apply for the proper import licenses, and to determine what else they need to import your goods and make sure you get paid, which is ultimately the most important part. So as you can see on the screen, a pro forma invoice looks a lot like a commercial invoice. And if you do it right, it will be very similar indeed. So pro forma invoice will specify who is the buyer and seller in this transaction and include a detailed description of the goods, the harmonized system classification of those goods, the price, the term of the sale, which would typically be expressed as one of the 11 current INCO terms, the payment terms, the delivery detail, including how and where the goods will be delivered and how much they will cost, and the currency used in the quote, whether it's US dollars or some other currency. Now, it's also very important, and this is something that people don't always do, but it's always important that you date your pro forma invoice and include an expiration date. There can be a lot of volatility in the export process. We've seen that in the last two, three years. So it's important that you minimize your risk by setting a very specific time frame for your quote. Now, there's a couple of things I just mentioned that I want to take a moment to talk about before I move on. The first was the harmonized system or HS classification of your goods. Now, I'm sure this isn't new information for you, but just as a reminder, the HS codes are defined by the World Customs Organization and used by most countries of the world as the basis for classifying your goods for import and export. It's a six-digit code that should be the same in the U.S. as it is in your buyer's country, and it's what is used by your buyer's customs authority to determine the duty rate for your goods. The HS code defined by the World Customs Organization is used to create the 10-digit harmonized tariff schedule of the United States for imports into the U.S. and the 10-digit Schedule B code used for exports out of the U.S. Now, keep in mind that the HS and HTS, HTS codes can and do change. Every five years, the World Customs Organization releases a revised list of the HS codes, which they just did in 2022, and every country must eventually adapt. That doesn't mean that most HTS and Schedule B codes were changed in 2022, but U.S. exporters and importers should make it a habit to review the harmonized tariff schedule each year to see if, by chance, their product codes need to be updated. But I'm digressing here. An exporter needs to know their current 10-digit Schedule B code when they or their agent is ready to file through the automated export system. And I'll talk about AES in a little bit more detail just a bit later. 
All you need to know right now is that a pro forma invoice should include the six digit harmonized system code for your products because that number is going to be the same in the US and in the country of import. Now, I also mentioned that you sh should include the term of sale on your pro forma invoice. For an international transaction, that term of sale is typically expressed as one of the 11 INCO terms agreed upon by the International Chamber of Commerce that defines who is responsible for the various steps of the export import process. This uh, INCO terms 2020 chart of responsibility and transfer of risk that I have on my slide summarizes what functions the seller and the buyer or the exporter and the importer is responsible for under each of the terms. Using INCO terms is more complicated than can be summarized in a chart, but I think this chart provides a good overview. And you can download a copy of this chart for free from the shippingsolutions.com website. So once you've sent out your pro forma invoice to your international prospect and you've received their order, you need to prepare your goods for shipping, including the paperwork that must accompany the goods. Of these documents, the commercial invoice is one of the most important. It includes most of the details of the entire export transaction from start to finish. Now, I often get questions from people who look at this sample commercial invoice and wonder why it looks so different from the invoices their company uses for their domestic orders. Now, keep in mind that the invoices you create for your company's accounting or ERP system are accounting invoices used to get paid. This invoice, on the other hand, is used for the export purposes. As I mentioned just a little bit ago, this commercial invoice is going to look a lot like the pro forma invoice you initially sent your customer to serve as a quote, although now it includes some additional details you didn't know before. So for example, you probably now have an order number or a purchase order number or some other customer reference number. You may have, to, you may have additional banking and payment information you should make sure to include any relevant insurance information and include any other details that will ensure prompt delivery of the goods and full payment from your customer. Now, this commercial invoice also helps you stay compliant with U.S. export regulations. If any of the goods in your shipment require an export license or are eligible for an export license exception, you need to include the destination control statement. This statement is intended to ensure that your buyer understands that the goods in the shipment are intended for the country listed on the invoice and they shouldn't be diverted to another country. Although you only need to include this statement on the commercial invoice for those items that are controlled under the Export Administration Regulations or the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, I recommend that you include this statement on all your export in invoices. In fact, I know a lot of companies that include this statement on their domestic invoices as well. Uh, the last time I ordered a laptop from Dell Computers, their invoice included this statement, and it doesn't matter where, the, where we reside. So if you're good somehow somehow end up in Iran, for example, having included the destination control statement on your commercial invoice is another form of proof that your company is doing its due diligence to stay compliant with U.S. export regulations. Now, some countries may require other country-specific invoices for exports to their countries. So, for example, Canada requires a Canada Customs Invoice for imports valued at more than $2,500 Canadian, unless the commercial invoice includes all these additional data elements. If your buyer resides in one of the 15 Caribbean community countries, they may request that you include a CARICOM invoice with your shipment. So you should be aware of these country-specific invoices as well. Now, an export packing list may be more detailed than a packing list or a packing slip you provide for your domestic shipments. Your freight forwarder may use the information on the packing list to create bills of lading for the shipment. A bank may require that a detailed packing list be included in the set of documents you present to get paid under a letter of credit. 
and customs officials in the US and in the destination country may use the packing list to identify where certain items are packed that they may want to examine. It's much better that they know which box to open or pallet to unwrap than require them to open all your packages to find what they're looking for. The packing list identifies the items in the shipment by package and include the net and gross weight and the dimensions of the package, typically in both US Imperial and in metric measurements. It identifies any markings that appear on the packages and any special instructions for ensuring safe delivery of the goods to their final destination. Now, some countries like China and certain Middle Eastern countries require a certificate of origin for your shipments that identify in what country the goods originate. The, these certificates of origin usually need to be signed by some semi-official organization like a chamber of commerce or a country's consulate office. This certificate of origin may be required even if you've included the country of origin information on your commercial invoice. Usually a chamber of commerce will charge you a fee to stamp and sign your certificate or require you to be a member of the chamber for them to stamp it for you. You'll need to deliver a completed form to the chamber office where they will then stamp it and sign it. Now, I've heard in the past where companies have gotten a stack of blank certificates signed and stamped by their chamber, or even in cases where the chamber has given them their stamps to, uh, to certain member companies. However, these practices are not allowed and could cause a chamber to lose its ability to provide this certification. How can a chamber verify that you are who you say you are if they don't even control their own stamp? Now, one of the many different things that has happened to our industry during COVID is an accelerated use of an electronic certificate of origin, uh, also known as an ECO. With an ECO, exporters can apply for a chamberized certificate of origin online and receive the certificate electronically or overnight by courier. Now, that was very important during COVID when many chamber offices were actually closed. But even as they reopen, many companies find that the service is uh, less expensive and more convenient than schlepping back and forth to the chamber offices. We do offer that service through our Shipping Solutions website, um, and we've seen an amazing growth of electronic certificates that um, exporters are generating through our portal. In addition to the generic certificate of origin form, there are also country-specific certificates of origin. The United States currently has signed 14 free trade agreements with 20 different countries in which US goods are eligible for reduced or zero duty rates when imported into those countries. You'll find a list of those free trade agreements on this slide. Some of the free trade agreements such as the US MCA and CAFTA include more than just one country besides the United States. To be eligible for these reduced tariff rates, in most cases, the importer must be able to verify that the goods they are importing qualify under their specific free trade agreement. Now, we don't have time today to talk about the rules of origin and preference criteria under the free trade agreements, but there are essentially three ways goods become eligible. One, they are wholly grown or produced in the United States, like soybeans or hogs raised in Minnesota, where I'm from. Uh, the goods are substantially transformed. Or third, the value of the non-originating parts in a good is less than a specific percentage of the total value of the goods. Now, this is a very simplified explanation of how goods qualify under a free trade agreement, but I hope you get the point. You can't say that a good qualifies simply because it comes from, a U comes from the US. The rules are more complicated than that and the importer must be able to prove their claim. And how can they do that if they don't produce the goods? They must rely on the exporter or the producer of the goods that the, to verify that the goods in fact qualify. In most cases, the exporter does not have a complete it does not have to complete a specific form to make the claim. Uh, a printed or electronic document on company letterhead that includes all the required information 
will suffice. Uh, but that being said, most companies I talk to prefer to use model templates of the form, which usually look very similar to the USMCA certification of origin to ensure that they've included all the required information and to make it easier for everyone, the importer, their broker, customs, to recognize that they are making a claim under the appropriate free trade agreement. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement replaced NAFTA on July 1st, 2020. So it's now been in effect for uh, almost three years and is fully implemented. Now we don't have time to, or nor do I have the expertise to dive deep into the USMCA. Uh, the most important, important point I'd like to make, and this counts for all the free trade agreement certificates of origin, is that exporters should not sign the form unless they know it's accurate. I get calls all the time from exporters who just want to know what they should put down for the preference criteria so that they can sign and return a form that the importer told them they need to provide. They have no clue if their goods qualify and they certainly don't have any documentation to back it up. A company can face significant penalties if they get audited and can't prove that the goods do in fact qualify. That means they need to keep information they use to make that determination. And if you can't prove it, you shouldn't use it. Uh, sometimes called a certificate for export or a certificate to foreign governments, a certificate of free sale is evidence that goods such as food items, cosmetics, biologics, or medical devices are legally sold or distributed in the open market freely without restriction and approved by the regulatory authorities in the United States. For manufacturers and exporters of pharmaceuticals and sometimes food products, the customs authority in the country of import may require a certificate of free sale from the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. For other types of products, they will accept a certificate of free sale issued by a chamber of commerce. So you should check with the import of the goods if they require an FDA issued certificate. Otherwise, a chamber issued certificate is faster and cheaper to obtain. Now, unlike a certificate of origin, you don't need to provide a certificate of free sale for every shipment. Instead, you may need to provide a certificate of free sale when you first try to import your product into a specific country. You're essentially informing the customs authority in that country, this is a new thing I'm starting to import, and here are my support documents that confirm this product or products are legal to sell in the country of manufacture. To obtain a certificate of free sale, you need to supply a declaration from the manufacturer on company letterhead that the goods are manufactured in the United States. You must also submit copies of at least two invoices used by your company within the past 12 months, showing that you've sold these products to two different US customers. Now, again, that's something that we can help you with on our Shipping Solutions website if you, if you need that. So the shipper's letter of instruction or SLI. So one of the most important partners an exporter will work with is their freight forwarder. A forwarder usually arranges the transport of goods with the carrier and helps ensure that you've taken care of everything that needs to be done for this process to go smoothly. Depending on the terms of the sale you agree upon with the buyer, remember that's typically the INCO term you choose, the freight forwarder may be hired and working for the exporter or in the case of a routed export transaction, be hired and working for the buyer. Regardless of who hired the forwarder, it's important that you provide them with the information they need to successfully move your goods. The shipper's letter of instruction, abbreviated as SLI, is the document usually used to facilitate that communication. Now, I also often describe the SLI as sort of a cover memo included with all your other export paperwork that you've generated to tell the forwarder what they need to know about your shipment. 
Depending on whether or not the Florida works for you, the SLI may also include a limited power of attorney, giving them authority to act on your behalf for this shipment. In addition, depending on who hired the forwarder, the SLI may grant them permission to file the export information electronically through the automated export system, also known as AES. Most export valued at more than $2,500 per item must be submitted to customs via AES. Now that's a very ex uh, broad explanation of the AES filing requirements. But the point I want to make here is that filing through AES is an important consideration for many exporters. If the freight forwarder is hired by the buyer, then it's the typically then it's typically the forwarder acting as an agent for the buyer who typically does the AES filing. Now, even if you as the seller is the one who hires the forwarder, you may pay them to do the AES filing on your behalf. In either case, even if you aren't doing the AES filing yourself, you are legally required to provide certain data elements to the forwarder so the filing can be done properly. And the SLI is the document you use to do that. Now, as an aside, I strongly believe that the exporter should almost always be the party that does the AES filing, even in a routed export transaction where the buyer picks the forwarder. And you can negotiate with the buyer to give you permission to do that filing. Filing through AES is not hard to do, and it gives you more control over the process. More and more of our clients are assuming that responsibility for every export shipment for just that reason. Now, however, I understand that many companies do rely on their freight forwarder for their AES filings, so an accurately completed SLI is very important. So at this point, I've, um, I've talked about the six most common forms that an exporter will produce. The pro forma invoice, the commercial invoice, the packing list, a certificate of origin, a certificate of free sale, and a shipper's letter of instruction. But remember, this is just typical. There may be other documents you need, depending on what, where, and how you're exporting, and how much or how little responsibility you want to take on. An inland bill of lading is often the first transportation document created for an export. It can be prepared by the inland carrier or you can create it yourself. It's a contract of carriage between the shipper and the goods, uh, shipper of the goods that states where the goods are going. It also serves as your receipt that the goods have been picked up. In an international shipment, the inland bill of lading is not typically consigned to the buyer. Instead, it is typically consigned to the carrier who will be moving the goods internationally, or if not directly to the carrier, to a forwarder, a warehouse, or some other third party who will consign your goods to the carrier when it's ready. Another additional document you may need or want to produce is the ocean bill of lading. So if your goods are being shipped by ocean vessel, you'll need an ocean bill of lading. An ocean bill of lading can serve as both a contract of carriage and a document of title for the cargo. A straight bill of lading consigned to a specific consignee is not negotiable. The consignee can take possession of the goods by presenting a signed original bill of lading uh, to the carrier. A negotiable bill of lading is consigned to order or to order of shipper and is signed on the back by the shipper and sent to the bank in the buyer's country. The bank holds on to the original bill of lading until the requirements of a documentary collection or a letter of credit have been satisfied. Now, Minnesota-based Cargo, which used to be a client of mine, uh, they explained to me how frequently a single shipment of soybeans or some other commodity can be bought and sold during a journey across the ocean, and a negotiable bill of lading helps them do that. Now, if your goods are being shipped on a plane, then an airway bill is required. Unlike an ocean bill of lading, an airway bill can, can never be negotiable. Instead, it's a contract of carriage between the shipper and the carrier. If your products are considered dangerous goods by either the International Air 
Transport Association or the International Maritime Organization, you need to include the appropriate dangerous goods form with your shipment. Shipping dangerous goods or hazardous materials can be tricky. And before you do it, the appropriate people at your company need to be trained in the proper packaging, labeling, and documentation of these shipments. The document you see on the screen with a red border is the IATA form, the International Air Transportation uh, Association. Uh, it's called the Shipper's Declaration for Dangerous Goods and is required for air shipments. There are different versions of the form. Yeah, you'll also often see it. Well, I have this a little bit wrong. So there are different versions of this form. Um, and they need to be filled out by someone who has been specifically trained on international trade or on dangerous goods forms. Uh, the bank draft. So during my discussion in the of the negotiable ocean bill of lading, I mentioned documentary collections and letters of credit. What you see here is a bank draft that you may that may be used to collect payment for export under those terms. I'm definitely not an expert on trade finance, but I do know that many of my clients use this bank draft in order to collect payment for their exports. So I've tried to give you a basic understanding of the typical documents you might need to create for your export shipments. Six documents that are very typically required and five additional documents that you may need. I often get asked by exporters, particularly new exporters or companies that are looking to expand their exports to new markets, how they know what documents they need to produce. And the answer is very simple. They need to ask. If you're going to get this right, if you're going to make sure your goods clear customs at both borders, arrive in a timely manner, and that you get paid in full, you can't start thinking about paperwork only once your goods are ready to ship. When you are talking to a prospective customer in a foreign country, your discussion can include, should include which export forms are required and who is going to prepare them. If you don't understand what they're looking, what they're looking for, ask. If what they're looking for doesn't make sense, don't be afraid to push back until you are satisfied. Talk to your freight forwarder and your bank to find out what documents they think you'll need for your shipment. Your freight forwarder and banker are your partners in this enterprise, and they should be forthcoming with advice and assistance. If they aren't helpful, find someone else to work with. David, uh, this is Rudy. Uh, a question for you. Uh, aside from the bank, which is a, an obvious one, who would the who are some of the people they would be asking these questions about which documents are going to be needed? Well, the freight forwarder uh, is a big, big resource. Uh, the buyer of the goods, the, the, whoever's going to be responsible for importing the goods into the country of import, uh, there should be a conversation with them as part of the, I, I would urge people when they are negotiating a sale and are working on a sales contract, whether it's written or verbal, that they outline the documents that they need and identify who is going to prepare those documents. The U.S. Commercial Service Office can be very helpful in that regard as well. There are offices located around the country, and they have offices in many of the foreign countries as well. So if you connect with your local commercial service office and, and ask for assistance, they may reach out to representatives in the in-country offices for assistance with that as well. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so once you've uh, determined what documents you need, Make sure you fill them out completely and accurately. It's important that your information is consistent across all your documents. A wrong address on a form could slow a shipment. A discrepancy in how you describe a product may cause problems at your bank. And I shouldn't have to say this, but accuracy also includes honesty. I've heard too many examples of companies that have changed the HS classification of their goods on their paperwork at the request of the buyer who is trying to reduce the amount of duty that they must pay upon import. Or the buyer will ask the exporter to lower the price of the goods on the export invoice or mark it as a shipment of samples with no value to save them money. Now these requests may sound harmless, but they are fraud 
and they can get the export company as well as the individual who signed the fraudulent documents in a lot of trouble. Not only could you be fined for these activities, in extreme cases, you could lose your export privileges and even end up in jail. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch on in this discussion of export documents is document retention. The various export regulations, and there are several different sets of regulations that impact exporting, require that in most cases, you keep copies of all your export paperwork for at least five years. Now, I'm not just talking about the export forms you include with your shipment and that we've discussed today, but also any correspondence, emails, notes from phone calls, any other kinds of information like that, that are part of your export transaction. In addition, I'd make sure to keep track of all the steps you've taken to do your due diligence to comply with export regulations, including the deny party screening, export license determination, and the review of any potential red flags that you may have encumbered, uncovered in the process. So most of the regulations say five years. They differ a little about a bit on when that clock starts ticking, whether it's the, uh, once a transaction has been completed or at the end of the uh, expiration date of the license that covers the product. But as a general rule, five years uh, is the rule. And David, you know, to, to jump here for just a second uh, and to kind of fill, fill in on the why, uh, at, at least one of the very important reasons that you want to keep this documentation uh, and including all those those other uh, ancillary documents and correspondence, uh, emails, and, and such that David mentioned is should something uh, red flag uh, the government and they want to do an audit of some sort, uh, you will have the necessary documentation so that it's transparent how things unfolded. Whereas if you don't have you know, the correspondence and, and other ancillary documents, it's going to be a lot harder to prove. And the burden of proof, unfortunately, is on you. Exactly. Yep. And I often hear from companies that we're just a small company. We don't need to worry about this. Or we've been doing business with this particular foreign customer for a long time. And we've never gotten in trouble. We don't need to worry about this. But if you talk to the Office of Export Enforcement and you ask them, you know, what the processes of how they are doing their investigations, doing their audits, think of it as a as a big ball of yarn with a little piece of yarn sticking out. And what they do is they may discover a problem at one company or a one with one freight forwarder or one transaction. And so they pull on that piece of yarn and they keep pulling it out and out. And that piece of yarn, it leads them to another uh, customer of that freight forwarder or a number, another vendor for that foreign customer. Or it may be just the fact that it's in that particular part of the world. And they just keep pulling strings. So the size of a company um, has often very little to do whether or not you become, you, you, you are part of the focus of an investigation that the Office of Export Enforcement is doing. So companies of all sizes uh, with long-term customers or new customers need to be aware that these regulations do apply and that you, for, you know, a little, a little due diligence up front could save you a lot of headaches down the road. For sure. And transparency is of the utmost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so as I started, as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, I've uh, published a blog post on this topic that includes links to other resources that explain different aspects of this presentation in more detail. You'll find an archive of all the international trade blog articles at shippingsolutions.com slash blog. Um, and so that's it. That's my presentation. Um, thanks for asking me to speak today. I hope you found it helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have either during the remaining of this webinar, or you can reach out to me directly by phone or email, and uh, Rudy will share my contact information uh, shortly. 
Absolutely. And I think what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to look at the questions. Uh, let me see here. Uh, so somebody said uh, also their designated customs broker in the U.S., or they can ask the uh, Tracks Global as well. Uh, that was uh, at least some of the comments. And then on the chat, if you'll give me a second here, I you know I think you know that uh, Miss Heidi. Uh, informed their one that she's going to be sending out uh, the slides and all of that a little bit later on. And uh, Mohammed said, uh, actually, the type of documents used in international trade depends on the environment of each transaction. Uh, uh, in the cuddling customs in the in the uh, two countries and all the organizations uh, organizations affect the transaction, like export support or any other part. Uh, may increase the cost. So he's just kind of giving us some advice of things that he's seen. Um, let me see here. Let me go back to this one. There was a, a young lady that, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, here's a question. It says, uh, for transport of liquids in bottles, is the weight of the product within the bottle considered the commodity weight? And the weight of the bottle considered the packaging this question is arising when the liquid in the bottle is for use alone in r and d and not as a product where the brand of the producer is important it's a kind of a complex question david do you have any insights into that I uh, offhand, I I don't know the answer to that question. That's a that's a great type of question to ask your very quarter, specific, and they may ask their uh, the carrier that they're working with on that. I, I don't know. I'm afraid I don't know the answer of that. Right. Okay. Off the here. All righty. Uh, let me see here. There's uh, uh, Martin. Uh, we had a very bad experience with a French company who underpaid us with small amounts and not worth fighting over. Is there any financial mechanism to stop this short changing? Well, there are different ways that you can you can make the term of the sale. I mean, prepayment might be something you'd wanna do. You know, there are different ways of getting paid. Uh, the Exim Bank has published a great guide on different types of uh, financing options. Um, there's also, foreign trade credit insurance program that they have. So there may be options that you want to look into related to that. Okay. Ms. Heidi, uh, I don't see any other questions or comments. Do you? Uh, do, 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 do. Um... Uh, Rudy, I, I see one in the chat. Um, Ms. Deborah had asked how many years we need to save all the documentation. Right. Um, and, yeah, and that was answered uh, by okay. David. Uh, the, and that is that uh, five uh, five years is usually the uh, the time period. But, you know, once again, I, I want to emphasize uh, David's comment is that uh, if you have any communications of any sort having to do uh, uh, with the transaction, you know, emails that went back and forth and next questions were asked and answers were given, I would keep those those emails as well. Yeah, the export administration regulations, for example, list very specific, a long list of very specific things that you should be saving. And then, of course, they have, uh, you know, the catch-all and other related documents. Um, so, but there is a long list of those documents that, or, or the type of correspondence and other um, things that you should save. Yeah. And uh, Salvador asked a question, and, and I think we've already answered it. Uh, you know, who will be asking the questions, the carrier uh, or customs? Uh, yeah, and I, you know, it depends on what kind of questions we're, we're talking about. Um, if, if, uh, if what Salvador is asking, who might be wanting to get answer, answers to this? Uh, you know, obviously customs might, might be one of those, but um, let me see here, and and Salvador, if you if you want to give some additional information to in terms of the question, that would be great. 
Um, for to like question. Okay. And uh, Alberto says uh, record keep record keeping is minimum three years, but in cases where litigation might be implicated, it could be as much as seven years. So, and I, I guess that's why the 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 five is uh, relevant here. And uh, I think that's all we have in terms of questions and comments. Uh, Ms. Ms. Heidi, do you or Jonathan see anything else? No, I don't see anything. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, if there's anything else, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Or... Yeah, yeah. And 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 Heidi, uh, do you, yeah, you, uh, raise your hand and, and then what you can do is you can uh, open the mic so they can ask, uh, ask their question directly. So yeah. feel free to do that. We'll give, it, we'll give it a few seconds here to see if somebody wants to do that. Uh, in, in the meantime, I want to, to uh, remind you that we will be providing uh, everyone's contact information, David and myself and Jonathan uh, and Heidi, so that if you have some additional questions, you can feel free to contact whoever you think is, is the appropriate person. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, David is a wealth of information. Uh, and David, uh, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about this document that uh, we see in front of us? Well, we have some additional uh, resources. Uh, we will be hosting, Shipping Solutions will be hosting a free webinar on Wednesday, April 19th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or Noon Central Time uh, about the USMCA and other free trade agreements. Uh, we partner with um, uh, Robert Imbriani, who presents on a lot of different webinars on a lot of different topics. He's a wealth of information, and he's going to be doing a presentation on the USMCA and free trade agreements. And you can go to the Shipping Solutions website. You can click that link on this slide um, and be taken right to the registration page. And like I said, that's free of charge. Uh, also in May, um, as you probably know, May is World Trade Month in the United States. Uh, we actually publish the World Trade Month uh, website, uh, worldtrademonth.com, and we have uh, a, a calendar of events that will be taking place around the country uh, during the month of May relating to international trade. So there are in-person events, lots and lots of online events. There are many of those are free. Uh, the ones that aren't are usually very affordable. Uh, so you can check out uh, worldtrademonth.com to see that events. We're up to 45 events now. And um, last couple of years, we've, by the time we reach May, there's usually more than 100. So if you uh, want to learn more about the events happening during that month, check that out. If you're part of an organization that is sponsoring events during May, there's a form on the website as well where you can submit your event and um, we'll re review it to make sure it's applicable and then we'll add it to the calendar as well and there's no charge for that um, and then uh, our blog i've mentioned a couple times and and rudy's mentioned um, our international trade blog passage is the international trade blog we've got more than 700 free articles related to various aspects of exporting and importing and you can find those and you can sign up for our twice weekly newsletter if you'd like to be notified every time we post a, a new article on the blog. Uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, th this information, first of all, the information that you provided is excellent, but this other information that we're, that we're showing right now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it would be, you know, really useful for you guys to, um, uh, to, uh, grab this links and and pin them so that you can have uh, uh, easy uh, and quick uh, access to the information whenever you you have a question. I mean, it's a, it's a plethora of of very useful information. Uh, just a tremendous resource. So so, David, uh, David, thanks thanks so much for uh, providing the information, uh, both in terms of the uh, webinar and in terms of what we're seeing right now, uh, Miss Heidi. Uh, what are some of the up upcoming webinars that the Arkansas District Export Council is going to be having? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, on May 17th, we're doing one um, from Blue Tiger International. And goodness, 
I don't remember the title of it off the top of my head. Yeah, it's a it's a regulatory compliance uh, uh, webinar that we're going to be ha having. So that is definitely something that uh, you know is um, a, a topic that that uh, is most people kind of struggle with, and so it's, it's definitely going to be a, a worthwhile uh, webinar to make sure that uh, that uh, nothing goes wrong, right, or as little as possible goes wrong. And again, on compliance, we're talking about Inco terms on May twenty fourth. And yes. therefore, the doing business in Mexico has just been scheduled for June 14th. 14th, 14th yeah. So we've got, uh, over the next few months, we've got uh, uh, two or three webinars. And, uh, you know, as um, uh, Heidi mentioned, the INCO terms that's going to be occurring uh, also is going to be very, very important. Uh, man, there's, uh, you know, uh, several different ways that you can... Um, Things that can drop between the cracks and and can cost you a lot of grief if, if you don't do it correctly. And Inco terms is the, definitely the first place that you need to be making sure that uh, that you uh, understand and that the that the your the opposing party uh, uh, understands exactly what the terms are because it dictates uh, you know who. Uh, who has the responsibility, or more correctly, at what point uh, the parties have or leave responsibility, and uh, all, you know, all these things that uh, can really go wrong. Uh, Heidi and I often talk about uh, the ever given uh, ship that uh, got lodged in, in the Suez, and boy, I tell you what, that could that that was a real nightmare for anybody who who had um, a uh, shipment uh, on on that ship. Uh, so so consequently, the uh, the Inco terms are super important and all these regulatory compliance topics can also uh, be um, uh, hurtful if, if you don't get it right. So I hope that you guys take uh, the uh, the opportunity to to attend these webinars that are coming up. And uh, Heidi, could you go ahead if, if you please would show the the um, um, links to our yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, being able to contact David and uh, or uh, Jonathan and Heidi or myself. If we can be of service to you, feel free to to contact us. We're, we're happy to to speak with you and answer any questions that we can. You know, and, and one of the things that Jonathan said uh, a little bit earlier is that, you know, while we have uh, 35 very experienced people in our district export council, uh, you know, no, nobody knows uh, everything. And so, but we do have access to uh, the U.S. Commercial Service and and uh, experts like David and hundreds of others uh, that can that have ex very specific expertise that that can be very, very helpful. So feel free to contact us and ask us uh, for whatever assistance you need, and we will do our very best to try to, to assist you. And uh, Jonathan, do you have anything? Yeah, um, just a couple of quick things. Uh, first off, again, thank you to the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions for uh, sponsoring this webinar to uh, to have Mr. Noah in here to uh, put on a great presentation. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, and lastly, uh, referring to those other webinars that we have coming up, Miss Heidi has put a link to our uh, LinkedIn page into the chat. So if you would uh, give us a follow on there, and that's probably one of the easiest and most informative ways to know what is coming up um, soon. Um, other than that, we have a Survey Monkey link in there. Let us know what we did right, what we could do better next time, or uh, if there's a certain topic that you like to hear, we'd love to hear about it. Other than Absolutely. that, that is it. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time today, and I uh, hope you have a great remaining of your week. Thank you, Jonathan. And with that, we will be signing off. David, thank you again. Thank you.